we need to begin with this question of why do we need to think about it? Well, why, why, why do we need an alternate? Is an alternative required? If so, why? And if yes, what form it should take? That's a question that we should ask ourselves. Uh, you know, in the next 10 minutes or so, I would like to uh, uh, sort of speak on these three points. So, do we need an alternative? For that, we will have to look at, let's take India as an example. I would, I would just uh, like to take India as an illustration and talk about it. Uh, let's look at uh, uh, the question of development in India, and particularly in the rural areas of India, which both uh, the other two panelists have worked extensively on. Uh, in one of the, in the, in the development literature, one of the most important uh, points that has been noted uh, with respect to successful cases of development, is that all these cases, all these countries, economies, transcended what in the development literature we call as the agrarian question. The agrarian question was transcended through some kind of breakdown of the feudal or semi-feudal land relations. But in most countries, it doesn't. There is no, as uh, R.M. Hartwell once wrote uh, in this uh, in, in this preface to E.L. Jones's book on Indian English agriculture, there is no successful case of any industrialized country in this world which did not transcend the barrier of inadequate agricultural surplus. That's the question. That's the point that uh, is well accepted within the development. Uh, it was true for uh, England, it was true for Germany, it was true for France, it was true for Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, name to have it. Now, one of the fundamental failures of the public policy, of state policy in India, has been its, its, its inability to address the agrarian question. The inability to uh, address the agrarian question is not a very minor point which we can sort of note and go, note and proceed. It's, one, it's, it's, a, it's a barrier of fundamental proportion. Because the reason why I say it is, it is linked not just to the fortunes of what happens in the rural areas. The point that Harbour was making was that it is related fundamentally to the future of industrialization itself. What happens with respect to the agrarian question determines what happens in the industrialization uh, uh, sector as well. For example, if you produce more food in the economy, it actually allows you to uh, uh, provide the urban worker who eats food but does not produce food with cheaper food, which allows the real wages not to rise beyond a uh, nominal wages not to rise beyond a point to keep the real wages constant. That's point number one. Second is that the rural areas in most developing countries provides the largest market that is available, a home market that is available in that locality, uh, in that in that economy, and as a result, the what for the increase of rural incomes from agriculture determine the kind of industrial demand that would come for a backward economy, particularly an economy like India. So one of the most important failures of Indian state policy has been it was unable to implement land reform in an economy, in, 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 in Indian society, which meant that the agrarian question stands unaddressed, unresolved in India. This also, it's one of the main features that has its impact, had its impact on the kind of industrialization record that India has had. Now, uh, even today, even today, if you see uh, the pages, I, 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 I am a very avid reader of Economic Times, uh, and the most important lesson that I take from the pages of Economic Times is that they, they are the people who uh, uh, really believe in this idea. They should be. Why should the agrarian question be transcended? Here is all. It is for a full-fledged capitalist economy to emerge. That full-fledged capital, capitalist economy to emerge requires the resolution of the agrarian question. And nobody is more qualified to speak on the agrarian question as a result than the capitalists themselves. What is the future of capitalism that is hinged on the resolution of the agrarian question? Now, if you look at whether uh, look at economic times in the months of May and June and so on whether the monsoon will hit or not. The blood pressure of industrialists in India is determined by the forecast from the monsoon uh, that, uh, that will hit the newspapers in the eight months of May, April and May. The rural demand constant continues to be a very important reservoir for whatever little demand the industrial also in India has. That's number one. There India has been a failure. Second is the question of, I'll take one example, one illustration from outside agriculture, which is education. By, as per the Indian constitution, by 1960, we were supposed to achieve compulsory universal education for our children. In 10 years from the promulgation of the constitution, we were supposed to achieve it. 
India never had a compulsory education law to begin with. Which most countries, which 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 of, of comparable uh, uh, of comparability, most countries which achieved these kinds of uh, successful development, as we call it, also expanded education for the children, eradicated child labor by abolishing it, and instituted compulsory primary education for the children, compulsory education, universal education, education for the children. India did not have a law of that sort. Even today, the count of child laborers vary according to the definition that you use, but there are crores of child laborers in India who continue to work in small enterprises. India continues to ban child labor only in hazardous industries and not other industries. And hazardous industries, but what constitutes a hazardous industry has been diluted. The definition has been diluted uh, 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 incrementally over the years. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is, when we say development alternative, we sometimes think that development alternative is an alternative to neoliberalism that has been uh, uh, implemented, the policies of neoliberalism that, has been, uh, that have been uh, implemented in India in the last 25 years or so. The problem is that uh, yeah, an alternative development policy cannot simply be anti-neoliberalism. It also has to take into account, an alternative evidence has to take into account the failures of Indian polity, the failures of Indian state policy prior to neoliberalism. So it's not that before neoliberalism, everything was fine in India. Everything was not fine in India. That's the whole, that's the first point that I want to make. So usually the alternative to develop, uh, uh, the alternative development policy, sometimes there is a disproportionate uh, emphasis on creating policies and uh, which go against the principles of neoliberalism, which is wrong, number one. But at the same time, at the same time, experience with the last 25 years actually shows that the policies of neoliberalism, in from what we call as the Washington Consensus, has been disastrous. Now, what it has done is, it, what the, where the situation was already uh, uh, very bad, it has already bad, it has basically pushed people and black their livelihoods into further poorer conditions in the last 25 years or so. And I want to take two features of this state policy, which have been extremely detrimental to the poor, extremely detrimental to the growth of the economy itself, uh, uh, and then sort of, uh, sort of uh, and end my remarks by pointing out these two core el elements of neoliberal policy. First is what the world itself has been discussing more recently, the question of austerity. Okay. The question of austerity or expenditure compression, that is a hallmark of neoliberal policy in India. Now, across the world as well, and in India as it is implemented. The idea here is that when neoliberalism got implemented, and this is the link to the first point that I made, when neoliberalism got implemented in India, the idea, the, the, the premise that uh, the agrarian question needs to be resolved. The agricultural surplus needs to be increased in order to begin the process of industrialization. That went into the back seat. In fact, the agenda of land reform has been completely jettisoned in the era of neoliberalism. And what instead you have is, what is the need to create an agricultural surplus to create demand in India? Why do you use the import food things using the free trade strategy that you have? You can simply use an external route to resolve your problem of uh, resolve the agrarian question by simply importing food grains and transcending the question of agricultural surplus and not by producing on your own. That's point number one. So land reforms already it was on the background. It has basically gone into oblivion uh, in the time after 1991. More so, more so because you are looking at an external economy because you are looking at export as a very important component of your growth pattern. You actually want to export more and more. High or what is called as high value uh, agricultural, uh, agricultural products, so that you can import uh, other commodities like food grains into your country using free trade agreements. Uh, it, uh, uh, the whole problem with India in the last 25 years has been that this strategy has been a colossal failure. In fact, uh, uh, Professor Harila is here, he works on trade, he will tell us uh, more authoritatively that one of the core uh, uh, outcomes of free trade policy in India in the last 25 years has been, particularly in sectors like agriculture, imports have outrun uh, exports. You actually have imports being dumped into India on a very large uh, quantum, and exports have not grown adequately uh, to, be, uh, to compensate for it. So free trade has not achieved anything for India, particularly in sectors like agriculture. Uh, 
On the other hand, you have the question of austerity. What is this question of austerity? You basically are pushed into a development paradigm where you are basically told that private investment should now drive the growth of the economy. And when private investment itself, uh, when the, private, the, the extent to which private investment can increase is itself constrained by the domestic demand in an economy. Otherwise, uh, 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 private invest, domestic private investment has to invest in India in order to export the commodities outside. That is unlikely to happen because we don't have very large industrial houses to do that kind of effort. So you basically, domestic industrial houses will invest in India only you, if you have adequate aggregate demand within India, coming from within India. In the absence of that aggregate demand, which is linked to the result, uh, lack of resolution of the agrarian question on the one, on, 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 to begin with, you basically have a strategy whereby you are looking at foreign direct investment and different other forms of uh, foreign investment to come in and uh, sort of plug that requirement. Now, when you look at foreign investment as a primary uh, source of financing your development pattern, one of the most important uh, criteria or, or, or conditions that you need to fulfill is you have to give them an element of security to the investment that comes into your country. When you when you seek to give that security to the investment that uh, is sought to be invited into the economy, you need to provide them with an element of, of certain indicators that these uh, these foreign investors choose or have chosen to judge your economic stability have to be fulfilled. One of the most important indicators so chosen is the fiscal deficit. A country with higher levels of fiscal deficit is considered as, an, uh, as a risky country, as a country where investment cannot safely go into it, make a profit and come back. Uh, where there are government regulations as well, this it makes it far more difficult for capital to move in freely and come out freely uh, without paying any kind of tax like the Tobin tax as uh, it's often spoken about. So as a result, you need to keep your fiscal deficit at very low levels in order to uh, invite or entice foreign capital into your country. The, 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 the fiscal deficit in an economy can be uh, kept under control in two ways. One is a revenue-led strategy, and other is an expenditure-led strategy. If you have, if you have good, uh, good revenue flow from your domestic sources, then it is not required that you uh, uh, cut expenditures in order to reduce your deficit. But in, on, on the other hand, if you are unable to tax your rich the political economy of your country is such that you are unable to tax your rich or you are not historically taxed your rich adequately and your revenues are proportionately lower, India is one of the lowest tax GDP ratios in the world, then you are forced into a strategy of cutting expenditures in order to uh, uh, keep your deficits low so that foreign investors become confident to come in and invest in your economy. Now this expenditure cut actually further exacerbates the problem of poor aggregate demand that you have in the economy. And it creates low growth. It creates poor level, poor, uh, uh, a poor number of jobs being low. Low. It, it does not create adequate number of jobs in the economy. And as a result, the whole strategy of uh, uh, of, ex, of of outward looking liberalisation that has been tried to be uh, implemented in India in the last 20 to 25 years has been facing occasional crisis. It has had often. It has, it has between, for example, between 2004 and 2009, for instance, it had a peak time. It had a very good time, thanks to a set of uh, uh, which was global conditions that existed during that period, but not before or after. In fact, during the 1980s and during the 1990s, the economic growth rates were hardly uh, uh, different in any form. It's like 5.6 and 6.1. So it, it's not that growth rates really increased in the period after 1991. So that so. So austerity has been a very uh, important uh, concern, uh, 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 an element of public policy in India after 1991, which has further exacerbated the already existing conditions of poor aggregate demand in the Indian economy. Point number one. Point number two is thanks to this austerity policies, thanks to this policy of expenditure compression, a question that was posed to me in the morning, one of the features of social policy, I'll come into the, I'll take another illustration from social policy, the movement from universalism to target. That is the next, uh, that is an associated step which has followed the expenditure compression. Uh, uh, social security benefits. It's not that India had a welfare state at any point of time. India had a very weak welfare state anyway. But whatever little welfare benefits were provided, for example, the public distribution system, were universal in, the, in their coverage before, uh, before in India 1997. The, core element of neoliberal policy has been the shift from universalism to targeting. 
and when you really think that uh, uh, benefits of uh, socialist policy need be need, need, need reach only the so-called needy people and not uh, uh, you know or, or, or the, the errors of uh, inclusion needs to be minimized and, uh, and irrespective of what will be the cost of errors of exclusion. That is the strategy that has been followed uh, in this shift from universalism to targeting. If you take the example of, uh, of, of the public distribution system in India, you can see how fallacious uh, this shift from universalism to targeting has been. The shift, this kind of shift in social policy has resulted in a case where millions of people who require uh, assistance from the state, who require food security or subsidized food from the state, have been excluded from access to the public distribution system by dividing the population into DPL, APL, and so on. The funny part of the, uh, this story is that the government did not have any policy or any concrete or robust methodology to distinguish who is DPL and who is APL. Uh, <laughs> so, this is conference policy. <laughs> we ask then you give me that. <laughs> In this session, we are talking about very economic. So, so I, I know it's yeah. easily and then... Uh, yeah. um, and the difficulty to remove this. So uh, the, the core element of this, uh, this, 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 this actually shows how how a policy can be, I want to, I use this as an illustration in my classrooms to, to show how how pathetically stupid uh, public policy can be in the shift from universalism to targeting. Universalism to targeting involves two steps. Targeting involves that you need to first estimate how many poor people are there, how many so-called needy are there. And from there you need to estimate, once, that, once you have estimated how many poor people are there, the next, second step is identification. Who are these people? So, so you have the NSS surveys in India, NSSO surveys in India for consumption expenditure, which you use to actually find out how many poor people are there. I'm not getting into the debates on the poverty line. It's actually a distribution line in India. You have about 26 rupees per day and 32 rupees per day in rural and urban areas being used to define who is poor and who is not poor. I'm not getting into that. But you use a poverty line of that sort to divide the population into who is poor and who is not poor. You have to say, suppose you get around 30 to 35 percent of the 35 percent of the population is estimated as poor by using a poverty line of that sort from the NSSO surveys. Now, from there, the sample survey. You only know that's roughly 35 percent of the people are poor. That's all. But who are? Who are, do you fall in it? Do you fall in it? Do I fall in it? There's no idea. Uh, that that problem is remains unsettled. So you. So the problem of estimation is taken care of, but the problem of identification remains. So from sample survey, you need. So you need to move to a census survey to find out who is BPL and who is APL. Now this is a very strange study so a survey that is usually done. This this 13 point survey where you are asked whether you have a uh, whether is it there is a whether you have a black and white TV or a color TV whether you have a disabled person in the household and 13 utterly stupid questions are asked and you are scored on that basis and you are, are marked and it's like an OGP and then you receive uh, at the end of your courses you get a overall score at the end of it. This is a very interesting survey. This is a survey whose answer is known before the survey is conducted. Okay. But why is the answer known before the study is conducted? Because you know that the answer should be 35%. The answer has to be 35%. You just have to figure out who those 35 are. That's all. So the part of the problem is settled before the study begins. Right? Now, neoliberalism works in funny ways like this. So you basically do this survey and rank people from below and cut at 35. And then those 35 are people, others are APL. Now, this kind of arbitrary division has actually created havoc in the livelihoods of the world. Millions of households have been excluded from access to public distribution system thanks to this targeting. The targeting also is fundamentally different in the uh, philosophically untenable argument. Amartya has written about it in a very interesting paper called The Political Economy of Targeting. He writes how, uh, it, it, so it, in some sense, it sort of ends up, uh, one, targeting involves higher administrative costs compared to universalizing. You need to, you need to do these surveys, you need to identify who is poor, who is not poor, you need to constantly update the database. Universalism does not involve all these costs. If you did, everybody is covered. So costs may be actually higher in a targeted policy compared to a universal policy. Second is, if you have a universal policy, if you have a targeted policy and people get excluded from it, the poor have to actually go to the state and actually say, why did you exclude me? I'm actually poor. Right? It involves an element of degrading yourself. 
it involves an element of when the state will say, no, 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 you're not poor, you're lying. Right? So it involves a criminalization of the poor in that sense. So there is a degradation and criminalization, a degradation of the dignity and criminalization of the, of the everyday life of the poor, which results from unthought of uh, uh, policies of targeting, which also is a, a consequence of this kind of policy. So austerity uh, and uh, targeting form two core elements of neoliberal policy. I just, I'm just giving an example of, of two illustrations from neoliberal policy to underline the problems, the new problems that have arisen after 1991 in an economy like India, in addition to what existed already. The education problem, the education problem, and all these problems, the, the solution to all these problems have become far more complicated thanks to the coming in of neoliberalism. And the question of development alternatives has to be thought of from this viewpoint. So it is not simply a question of reversing neoliberalism. A development alternative in a country like India has to take into account the historical legacy of our problems as well. It has to, a development alternative in the Indian context has to have as its prime component the resolution of its agrarian question or the implementation of land reforms in India. That is a, that is a non-negotiable necessary condition for a, 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 a development alternative to emerge. Second, it should of course move away from the policies of austerity that we have. It has to be a, for example, a country like China. It is hugely export-led in some ways, but the internal uh, demand, the internal uh, uh, home market of China provides it with an enormous cushion compared to other countries like India when it comes to an export shock. A global economic stagnation is likely to affect or the, the, the demand for industrial goods in China is likely to be far less affected by a global economic shock than in a country like India because the domestic demand in China provides an important cushion for their economic, for their economy. That option is not available for countries like India. So that, so you need to focus more. This is not to say that you need to, be, you need to turn autarchic in some sense. That's not the argument at all. Uh, and, and the argument I'm making is that you need a strong emphasis on domestic demand in any such uh, alternative uh, development policy that you want to think about. Third, in terms of social policy, there has to be very strong emphasis on ignored aspects of the past, like introducing compulsory primary education and complete abolition of child labor and so on on the one hand, and a focus of, on universalization of social services on the other hand. Without, uh, and, and this is not the time to, to sort of create a checklist of things that should be there in a development alternative. What I just thought in the 10 to 15 minutes I have here is to highlight what should be the core or, uh, or the top priorities that should be highlighted in any alternative development policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ramakumar. The chair is leaving up to the briefing from the organizers. Ramakumar took exactly 17 minutes. But uh, it was an unenviable task to tell the story of uh, India's failed alternative in 17 minutes. Thank you. Now, Prof. Joe's listening. Thanks. All through my life, I was never a professor. And uh, I feel quite uneasy when that designation is conferred on me. In the early days of the Center for Development Studies, when a real professors donned the place, we were all underdogs. We never had the courage to call ourselves even primary school teachers at that time. And then, subsequently, a greater part of my life was spent as a civil servant, if you want to call it an international civil servant. But that did not, by any chance, entitle me to the privilege of calling myself a professor. A profession I consider, I treat with a great deal of respect. But that's besides the point. Um, 
the question we are trying to answer today is, are there alternatives to the beaten track of economic development? I'm afraid we don't have. Since I like the, I lack the confidence to articulate that position, I try to look for some supporting material in the introductory brief prepared by the organizers of this meeting for this conference. I must confess that did not help either. With a lot of respect to them, this is not to detract the value of what they produced. The fact remains, all of us thinking about development alternatives have a fundamental problem. We lack the ability to think and write with clarity the questions we are trying to address. And that means it's a major challenge that has got to be overcome in a multilingual society. We have got to think totally different when it comes to articulating our thoughts. I, for one, myself, believe it's time we went, we went back to the mother tongue, tried to crystallize our thoughts, and then tried to put across them in a different language if there be any need. I think all of us should try to, to do that kind of original thinking about the development paradigm, the de development alternatives in our own language. I don't mean to say it has got to be the mother tongue, but then the language we are most comf comfortable, and for many of us, it should be Malayalam language. But then, since I consider myself a novice, trying to understand the concept of development alternatives, let me try to start delineating the components of the classic path to development, which the pioneers of this conference have termed the income-led growth path. And then ask a question, can we avoid or short-circuit that path spelt out by the, by, the, by the leading professionals? The components to the classic path have been spelt out by the, one of the most prodigious minds in the economic profession, Simon Kuznets, who analyzed the long-term growth path of nations. He tried to do it in a major study called the growth of nations. And uh, he tried to list the components of growth. The major thrust of my argument is, look, we cannot we cannot short circuit these components. Let me try to spell them out. The currently developed world over the last 150 years of their growth path, they have crossed certain thresholds, certain landmarks, long term changes in the sectoral composition of output and employment which means a lot of things we are trying to deal with today about the importance of agriculture, which Professor Ram Kumar talked to you about. All those things have got to be looked in a historical perspective. We are talking about situations which over a long period of time change. The importance of agriculture diminished systematically in a society which accounted for 75% of the output and employment output and employment at the beginning at the middle of the 19th century we are reaching a stage in the rich countries they do not hold more than 5% of the total level they might still have something like 10% of the total output in the process <coughs> workers moved away from agriculture into the other sectors of the economy Manufacturing, construction, services. They were distinctly marked by high productivity rates and the product per worker in agriculture 
fell short of the productivity rates in all these modern sectors of the economy, which is what led to the kind of huge migratory movements, the largest migratory movement in history, which Galbraith called was urbanization. People moved to, to towns, to the cities, in search of a living. It came against the background of deprivation which took place in Western countries. The kind of deprivation we, have, we, we sort of witness in our countryside. It came against the background of violence. It came against the background of deterioration in living conditions. All these led to the kind of mobility into the urban areas. That's what happened in the West in the 19th century. And that's what led to what people subsequently called the social question of Europe, something which was precipitated by the fallout of the Industrial Revolution. Again, let's not go into that. The fact remains, over a period of time, the sectoral composition of output changed, sectoral composition of the labor force changed, but then at the end of it, it turned out to be beneficial because all those people who migrated to the urban areas during the period of the Industrial Revolution witnessed unprecedented increase in their prosperity levels. But then there is a hidden dimension to that. That path to prosperity was littered with blood and sweat of people, something which we conveniently ignore. Things we talk about the social question, the kind of misery, anguish, which, which millions of people were put to, which culminated in many world wars, but that's besides the point. The fact remains that path to prosperity was traversed through blood and sweat of millions of people, not just in Europe, but in the colonies too. We all paid a price in that process. But in the end, the system tracked. A, they created institutions which safeguarded the interests of the winners, and the losers had disappeared by that time. The losers were in the erstwhile colonies. We belong to that category. But then we are also trying to emulate the growth experience of these countries. And the argument I'm trying to make, you may not like it, is there is no way we can short circuit that process. But then we have got to go through that development process. At best, I'll keep on rubbing this point, we can accelerate the pace through specific targeted policy interventions. Nonetheless, there is no escape from that path. Again, let me come back to the components. Changes in the status composition of the population. That means over a period of time, the category we call the self-employed moved out or diminished. In their place came the most significant category of the modern economy, the wage employees. The advent of these people, we look with a lot of worriness, a lot of suspicion, a lot of anxiety, apprehension. Nonetheless, it's their coming to the fore which led to the growth of nations. They emerged as the biggest, the most powerful engine of growth because they acquired the kind of purchasing power that sustained economic growth. But then the institutional safeguards which modern economic growth brought in its train helped them secure their position in societies and sustain that consumption level. And this is the kind of lesson we have got to learn. Create institutional safeguards that can sustain the pattern of growth, the, 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 the mode of growth, make them, take them to higher levels of living. Again, within the composition of the workforce, if we go by the beaten track of nations, the blue collar workers, we have apprehensions about them too. There are, the, 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 there are various versions in caricaturing them, but then the fact remains, they changed over a period of time. That collar disappeared, it became white collar, or rather that's in the process of diminishing, disappeared. And then people moved on to more improved skill categories of the workforce, and they 
came to dominate the picture. So there is the kind of a pronounced change in the composition of the workforce taking all over the world. And I think this is something we ought to reckon on and try to, to absorb the lessons. This is something innovative over a period of time. Again, the policy interventions we talk about should be to accelerate that process, bring it faster into a reality. Let's not try to delude ourselves into believing that by blocking it, we will be making a point. No, it certainly will not happen. Then again, um, I told you about employees' compensation changes in the age distribution, gender structure, skill composition of the labor force. Pronounced, profound changes happened over a period of time. The labor force became compressed in certain age groups. The earlier age groups, I mean, in a kind of phase in which child labor was very much an article of faith, was part of our living a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, that changed. People went in for higher education, went in for primary education, subsequently to higher education. The period of their spending in educational institutions kept on increasing. So much so, the labor force belonged to a compressed age group, say from 20 to 25 onwards, right up to 60 to 65. A near homogeneity in the composition of the labor force. Likewise, profound changes took place in the gender structure of the labor force. All of us. Yesterday, questions were raised about the structure of the traditional society. We took it for granted that women had their assigned place, and that should be within the presence of the house. They should not be seen to be there walking into the labor force. And if at all they come, they should observe the kind of norms and customs and traditions of the traditional society. Things have changed. But then, in the earlier stages of development, we also had an opportunity to sort of mention about that the instinct is to withdraw from the labor force for women. To tell the rest of the world, listen, I don't have to do drudgery, hard work. But again, this is again something we inherited from the past. Things are changing so rapidly. The women workers who come into the labor force are far more skilled. There was a time in Southeast Asia when women came into the labor force, they were unskilled, semi-skilled, the kind of factory girls doing trying to do with the kind of processing work with, uh, with electronic components of garments. But then came subsequently a phenomenon, they withdrew from the labor force. And the next generation, lesser in number, turned out to be much more advanced in terms of skill formation. Both men and women entered the labor force as equal partners in many societies. That's why development has got to be viewed with a certain bit of, certain amount of composure. Change is underway. It may not happen immediately, but certainly when the new skilled labor force comes into the workplace, they're not going to be treated discriminatory. <laughs> Certainly, there is going to be a great deal of equanimity in the pay structure. The kind of disparities, discrepancies we loudly complain about, it's certainly not there in the past. It's there up to a point. But then my, my argument is they're in a much better position as sellers in the market, controlling the market, determining, demanding, deciding on their time and pattern of the deploying themselves in the level of all these are decided by people who enter the labor market. Pronounced changes are underway. And I think we should take that on board again, view them with the quantity. All these underscore the point that we should be relaxed about challenging the conventional mode of development. Again, let me repeat, we should be aiming to accelerate that process rather than preventing it or even trying to short circuit it. Uh, I talked about the primary, then again, again, visible changes happening with regard to the entry of workers into new domains of employment, technical, managerial, professional cadres. As skilled workers, they're increasingly entering. 
and there is this talk of technological displacement going to happen in a big way, but then demography will take care of it also in the sense in the long run. We probably don't have to worry about giving employment to older people, but then, then the point to be emphasized is society has got to give a lot more attention to creating institutions that will bring in distributing justice, bring in institutions that will take care of the interests of all those people who are there in the level force, who have gone out of the level force, meet their consumption requirements, their long-term social security requirements. These are the kind of challenges which your generation will have to address, say, 10 years from now. Once people come into the labor force, how on earth are we going to ensure secure living to them, whether they happen to be working or not? Can the society provide for that? If the society ever says that we cannot, one way or the other, we have got to make sure that the resources are mobilized sufficiently to make it happen. Otherwise, we again go back to the explosive times of the past where inequalities will simply create situations which will not be, which will be well beyond control. Therefore, institutional safeguards have got to be worked together by all people. Um, the point I want to say is that we cannot opt out of this, this growth trajectory. We can say that, look, this is not our idea. It's going to bring in a whole lot of problems. It's going to bring in ecological imbalances. But then this is where, again, the policy interventions come. We are, with the hindsight of the lessons of history, we are in a much better position to say, look, this is the kind of path we can avoid. This is the kind of control we can exercise. This is the kind of safety we should opt for, and not a blanket adoption of the sweat and blood path which the West took towards prosperity. We have the discretion to choose the most optimal path. I still repeat, our room for maneuver is limited, but then, there's something we can take the whole society forward. Um, where the emphasis has got to be on redistributive transfers, making it possible for all people to become beneficiaries of that process. And this is where I think in Kerala, we are not, I mean, you know, quite apart from our usual tendency to brag about developments here, distinct discernible progress has been made by way of and in creating the climate for an inclusive approach to growth. Making it possible for people at the lower, traditionally of the lower rung of the society to be inducted into educational mainstream, into the provision of reasonably good quality health care through public expenditure, the medium of public expenditure which made it possible for us to move forward. We also created institutions that secured the interests of people in the world of work. From all these things, it's a question of moving slightly, a short step forward, perfecting these institutions, which can secure the interests of all people in the world of work with appropriate institutional safeguards. We had the opportunity to talk about briefly yesterday. But then my point is, let's not undermine the regulatory regimes and the institutional safeguards. Instead, try to strengthen them. That is where we are going to move forward, and the dreams can be fulfilled. Thank you. It's almost time for the ballet to be addressed. Mr. Kevin is here, and uh, the organizers were insisting that we should have at least 20 minutes for discussion. So we should have discussion. And uh, after that, the voluntary practice should uh, get enough time. So I will have to be very brief. And in fact, uh, we cannot accommodate three presentations on uh, development alternatives in 
such a short time. Uh, I will just pose one question in the context of uh, these two earlier presentations. And probably, I believe some of these issues you might have discussed in the earlier sessions as well. Uh, in fact, Ram Kumar was trying to explain how and why the Indian attempt to develop an alternative failed. He showed in such a short time how we, India, failed in developing an alternative route to capitalist development. And uh, Dr. Jose, starting from the, the, the world economy picture, explained how difficult and challenging it is to have a kind of alternative in the third world context. Now, the question I would like to pose in five minutes is this. If the world system is so hostile, if the national policies are very uh, uh, hostile and uh, difficult, then how are we going to think about alternatives at the level of uh, states? provincial governments and local governments. We will have to work with local governments, local communities. We will have to work with cooperatives. We will have to work with state governments. And given such a hostile global environment, given such a hostile, hostile uh, uh, neoliberal policy environment at the national level, how are, going, how are you going to work with state governments? Can we think of alternatives at the level of state governments or local governments? And what kind of alternatives possible? Now, as Dos uh, was mentioning towards the end of his lecture, as far as alternatives are concerned, uh, we need not uh, start from clean state, at least in the context of Kerala. Kerala state had all the all, all limitations. Uh, we were operating under the cover of uh, colonialism. We had to work with within the limits of Indian constitution. We had such limitations. In spite of that, we were trying to evolve an alternative. And uh, uh, it's very clear that uh, this alternative work to a significant extent. It's not that no, we, we have been able to really come up with an alternative route, path of capitalist development. But in spite of the limitations, we could achieve whatever <coughs> Kerala could achieve, the high physical quality of life and all, about which we speak a lot. Now, the big question is this. We could do that in spite of the limit, limitation of the Indian constitution. But how long can we continue this alternative at the provincial level, at the level of local government, in the uh, hostile policy environment of neoliberalism, and in a world system which is <coughs> leaving less and less space for local alternatives? Uh, Ram Kumar was speaking about uh, land reforms at the at the national level. At the national level. Of course, so we could not address the, question, the agrarian question. We could not do anything about the, the land reforms. But in Kerala, we had a successful uh, land reforms. There were limitations. There are limitations even now, remaining. Uh, and in the area of labor, in the area of other welfare policies, we could do certain, certain things which resulted in the kind of advantages that we are currently having. But in my opinion, the, the challenges uh, that uh, both, of, both the other speakers spoke, the challenges that are coming from the world economy scene, the world system, and the challenges that are coming from the neoliberal policy framework at the national level, it's going to make the possibility of continuing with Kerala kind of alternative uh, model.
difficult. Take, take the case of uh, the present crisis of Kerala economy, the crisis in the, uh, in the plantation sector, the crisis in the agricultural sector in, in general. It's very obvious that the state government now cannot intervene in the way it used to intervene to offer fair prices for our farmers because of free trade agreements, because of uh, regional uh, arrangements. It's almost unthinkable for the Kerala government to have a buffer store, to have a procurement policy so that uh, we can give fair prices for our rubber growers or other uh, farmers. Because you know, if you start procuring, given the fact that our national borders are porous, we will end up procuring large supply from the from other other rubber producing countries. For example, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, those countries are also facing the problem of uh, lower prices. And they are trying to export, and they are subsidizing and exporting. And uh, if we are procuring then we will end up procuring all the rubber that is coming from those countries. Then take the case of labor. If we are very keen to protect the interest of our cashew workers or the workers in the traditional industry, it's not going to be as easy as it used to be earlier. Because capital is much more mobile than uh, it used to be earlier. Now, the Kerala capital, cashew capital, has already moved to Singapore and uh, uh, Africa. Earlier they used to move to uh, Tamil Nadu. Now they have become much more mobile. Capital is mobile. Industry is moving out of the country. Same threat of mobility of capital is there in the context of most other industries. So it is extremely difficult to have interventionist policies in isolation because the neoliberal conditions are making it difficult for a panjayat for a local government to be successful in evolving alternatives. This is uh, true of many other prices, many other sectors where the room for intervention is getting limited because of neoliberal environment, because of international trade agreements because of other agreements into which uh, India is entering into. So we are going to face a major crisis. We used to be very proud that we have made an alternative and we have the model of public action, collective action, long drawn out struggles through which we developed an alternative which was not a, a small achievement. Compare with uh, the recent developments in Latin America, for example. We were all very proud of Brazil, Venezuela, and uh, many of those uh, Latin American countries. And we were thinking that uh, Latin America is rising as a major alternative. Um, not of the socialist type, but uh, countries uh, which remain in the capitalist framework, in the, in the framework of social democracy. They are coming up with alternatives. That was the hope and that was being celebrated all over the world. But all those experiments are uh, facing reverses. Uh, they are being challenged now. But compared to that, if you, if you take the long period of Kerala's alternative, we can be uh, proud of what we have achieved. We have been able to sustain this alternative in spite of the constitutional limit, in spite of the fact that you know, we were forced to work with the market, in spite of the other kind of hostile environment, we could uh, achieve certain things, but it's going to be more challenging now. Now, how we are going to face the new situation is very important, not only for Keralites, but uh, for Latin American countries, and other countries which are similarly situated because they also face the same situation. A hostile world economic system, neoliberal policy framework, then different localities, small, small regions are trying to 
develop their own alternatives, their own ways out, their own ways of protecting minimum decent living of the citizens of such regions. But my point is this, I'll just conclude by saying this. Um, <clears throat> Kerala had to, earlier also, work with hostile environments. We had to fight colonialism, we had to fight the feudal system in the, in the state, we had to work with uh, markets. In spite of such very hostile economic conditions, Kerala could evolve, Keralaites could evolve appropriate, timely strategies of collective action, public action. Because now, probably, I think now it was more hostile when most of this public action was really taking place in Kerala. We were fighting against such big, big odds. But now, okay, new challenges are coming. But uh, I think we will be able to, we will have to give an attempt to overcome these challenges of facing neoliberal policy regime at the national level, uh, the, the world system which is becoming extremely unfriendly. We will have to evolve new strategies. And probably we will have to again uh, fall back upon the, the strategy of collective action. We will have to come together we will have to develop alternatives uh, to, to work with the world market, which is becoming hostile. Uh, but no, it should be possible for us to evolve new tools of dealing with a hostile world so that the conditions of living of people in Kerala can be uh, sustained. What other states could, what other regions, what other third world regions could not achieve in such hostile environment we could achieve. And it's the challenge of social scientists, it's the challenge of our political leadership to evolve new forms of collective action, new forms of public action, which will help us deal with a situation which is becoming much more hostile. And we have a lot of uh, brain to do that. We have a lot of uh, organizations, institutions, uh, and movements which can which can live up to expectations. And I am looking forward to the valedictory address because um, uh, Professor Condon has written extensively, extensively on uh, Kerala's path of development, collective action, uh, particularly with respect to local governments, with respect to labor movements, etc. So all this shows that we have been experimenting in dealing with uh, situations. So Kerala can probably, Kerala, now scholars are coming studying what happened to Kerala. So Kerala can probably continue this tradition of evolving small, small alternatives uh, and uh, uh, modes of collective action which will help us uh, deal with such extremely difficult situation which cannot be underrated or taken like. Uh, um, so it's now open for uh, discussion. We can have four, four or five questions. Uh, we should uh, have questions only, not uh, uh, detailed discussion or anything. So please come up with uh, pointed questions, and uh, we can address Tam Kumar and uh, Dr. Jose. You can leave me uh, from here. <laughs> I want to take more questions. <coughs> 60% uh, of our GDP comes from the services sector. I would like to know whether the IT sector is uh, coming under the services sector or is it, is it spilling over to manufacturing sector too? The second question, the rubber price crisis in Kerala is due to a black swan because globalization <coughs> brings out a lot of unpredictable black, black swan effects. My question is to Professor Ram Kumar. Sir, you mentioned that aggregate demand in India is less and we need to improve that. But during the period of global financial crisis, we speak of the decoupling theory where China and India 
remain aloof of this crisis because we had very huge domestic aggregate demand. So with the second largest population in the world and the GDP growing at a commendable rate, how can you argue that the demand, domestic demand in India is less? And, uh, you know, capitalism grew through sweat and blood people and so on. I agree because it grew through the blood of uh, the people of the third world principally. Uh, because capitalism did not overcome unemployment on its own through its spontaneous development. There are two major reasons why capitalism managed to, uh, at least the metropolitan capitalist countries, managed to avoid the kind of high unemployment that we are witnessing today, for instance. One was mass out-migration of people. For instance, in uh, 1820, Britain had a population of 12 million people. Between 1820 and 1915, 16 million people migrated out of Britain. In fact, in every year between these two, uh, in, during this period, more than half the increase in population of Britain migrated out of Britain. During this period, about 50 million people migrated out of the entire Europe, mainly to the temperate uh, regions of wide settlement. The, United, uh, the regions that we call today United States and Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and so on. Typically, the settlers went there, draw out the local inhabitants, the indigenous people, in many cases uh, massacring them. And in the end, they managed to avoid the social explosions that were about to, and that were uh, threatening them uh, in their home, that is Europe. That was one. The second was colonial loot. Colonialism, colonialism basically, uh, looting uh, the third world, uh, uh, deindustrialization uh, in the third world, and so on. So, these are the two factors which led to capitalism avoiding the kind of mass unemployment, which is haunting it back again today. Greece is, uh, Greece has 25% unemployment, Spain has 25%, Euro uh, European Union has 10%, United States has 10%, it, it, it could be, yes, yes, no, 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 that, that it has been conclusively demonstrated that it is wrong. Actually, it has been written. It, it, it has been plain, plainly has been written on the back question of the of the argument that it is only five percent. So, yeah, yeah. so my question is, what is the basis of your uh, belief that capitalism still remains the option for the third world? Because these two options don't remain within the ambit of the third world: out mass out migration or colonialism. We cannot have uh, coloni We cannot go and colonize other countries, and we cannot send uh, crores and crores of people out of our country. My question is to Professor Ram Kumar. See, we know that FDI to GDP ratio in India is less than 2%. Uh, then uh, domestic DI to GDP is almost 28%. If that is the case, why our uh, major citizens are run, running after countries and countries inviting more FDI? Can we have uh, a development uh, by utilizing our, our own resources? Okay, for short of time, I am not. So the title of the discussion is development alternatives. But the word I heard here is uh, they are big, they are hostile, and uh, final conclusion is it is difficult to opt out of the growth strategy. That means we ended up in flattering the neoliberalism. And uh, let me ask you one question. Is there any limit to growth? And one more question is the attempt of occupy movement, a foolish one from the part of the public. So when I get some serious. Uh, uh, with all due respect to both the uh, speakers on the dais, uh, uh, Dr. Ram Kumar sir and uh, A.V. Jo sir, uh, I came here uh, with the expectation that uh, uh, there should be, I mean, uh, an alternative model should be, a uh, model of development should be uh, uh, I mean, conceptualized. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, uh, the all the uh, it's uh, reverse happening. And uh, as Dr. Uh, Harilal uh, sir has rightly uh, questioned, uh, is why should I mean our rebellious subjectivity? I mean uh, we uh, we faced a more uh, a kind of I mean colonized. We, we were once colonized, and we fought against that. And uh, uh, now uh, it's it's capitalism. 
uh, uh, colonizing us in a, uh, a different way. So uh, why shouldn't our um, rebellious subjectivity be contented in, I mean, uh, why it, it should be contented with, within this neoliberal uh, uh, thing? I mean, as Marx says, uh, the life becomes a means, uh, a means for capitalism and not an end in itself. So uh, how should you, uh, I mean, and uh, one more thing, sir, uh, to, uh, to Aviso, sir, you said about the, pro, uh, it should be, uh, the institutions to, should be proliferated. When institutionalism happens, bureaucracy uh, uh, comes into power. Bureaucracy's power become more uh, hardened. And when bureaucracy comes, a kind of iron cage, I mean, I, it's it's called by um, uh, uh, Max Weber as an iron cage thing. So uh, I, it, it ends our human values. That's my question is towards uh, Dr. Ram Kumar. Uh, so you said about the issue of the methodological things being wrong in the public policy discourse. Uh, in that concern, a small doubt. How can the public be so sure about the accuracy of the data that is being collected? For example, the NFH survey for questionnaire for females is of 98 pages. That of males is of 38 pages. So you are asking questions to those people at least continuously for one and a half hour. So I just need to know how can we be so sure about the accuracy of the responses? Uh, no, uh, let me first uh, address the elephant in the room. Which is that, uh, uh, why did anybody speak about alternate? Uh, I, I thought I spoke about, I thought Joe spoke about uh, alternatives, but people don't appear to think that we spoke about alternatives. That appears to be the dilemma here. And, and see, the problem here is there is no alternative which is uh, black and white. There is no alternative which is uh, which I can give you from the pocket. Okay, take it from tomorrow. You have this. I can't. And, and, and that complexity has to be respected. The complexity has to be appreciated. Is it Let me add one more thing. Are we waiting uh, for a crisis are, to happen? Uh, are we waiting for a crisis to happen? Then we will bring up alternatives. No, I, I, no, I, I don't know what I'm waiting for. But the point I'm the point I'm saying is. Whether we, are, whether we have a crisis or not tomorrow, whether we are going to have a paradise tomorrow or not, I don't have an alternative from my pocket to give anyone. I, I, only what I can, the only thing that I can do is to, is to draw the contours of what I think can be an alternative framework given the problems that we have historically and historical and contemporary on the one hand, and as Professor Hilal mentioned, the, the, the constraints within which those have to be sought to be realized. That's the, the we are not, I don't want to speculate here on do this, do that, do, do, then you, that, I don't want to be a positivist uh, speculator of that sort. I, 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 what I try to say is to draw out one, some of the major problems that our economy and society have been facing, our failures in addressing some of them, how some of the more recent phenomena have actually further complicated or exacerbated some of those problems, and what policy stances should we adopt to address some of them more effectively. That's what we can say. And with all of them within the constraints that Dr. Harilal mentioned uh, at the global and domestic level. Let me start from uh, answering the points from, that, from there. No, it's stuck soon. Start from the global level, okay? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think the emergence of Bernie Sanders or the British uh, uh, emergence of the British, new British opposition from the Labour Party needs to be taken or underestimated in any form. In, the, in, in some words, it, in some sense, it actually shows that the crisis of 2008 effects are lingering. And the West is actually looking for all of these, which are not available to all, which, are, which, go, which the dominant uh, mainstream of today does not provide them. Okay? So they are looking for all of Sanders has put forward an argument, he is a democratic socialist. And people ask, who, who are you when you say democratic socialist? He's in, look to Denmark. Okay? And others are calling you communist. Okay? Now, there is a, so even there, there is a confusion. First, let's decide whether he's a communist or he's a, a democratic socialist, which used to be called social democracy at one point of time. Now, there again, there is a, the discussions are going on as to what is a better alternative. Latin America appeared to offer a solution to us. But then Latin American uh, experience appears to be uh, failing uh, uh, as we go by. So there's a crisis there. In India, Kerala used to offer an alternative to us. But as Dr. Harilal mentioned here, Kerala, it's not, it's not clear whether within the constraints that we ha can have, the Kerala type of alternative can proceed to be the dominant alternative or not. So all these 
So we can, so we can only all speculate in a very safe way as to how we can do. We have to take, as Mao said, we have to cross the river by feeling the stones. And I don't want to plunge into a river without knowing its depth. And I want to walk into the river slowly feeling the stone, where stone is, what depth is, and then we that's how an alternative development trajectory can be ever formulated, a meaningful one. Uh, the, since the last point that I, 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 I'm not going to take all, but he's given me only two minutes. Uh, the question of decoupling. So the idea that the, it, that used to be a myth. So we used to think that we are decoupled. When the uh, when the global economic crisis came, and we sort of appeared that we are sort of escaping the immediate impacts of that crisis, the argument was that we are decoupled from the global economy. Our banking sector is public, and hence we don't need to worry beyond the point. But then, as soon as it struck us that exports are drying up. As soon as it struck us that incomes are falling, the, uh, the kind of software exports that we were having at that point of time are stagnating, not growing, which is affecting demand internally. We thought of fiscal stimulus package. So between 2009 and 2011, we escaped the worst of it by having a very powerful fiscal stimulus package. But then that left our fiscal deficit at 6%. So when Pranam Mukherjee changed and Chidambaram came, he sought to cut expenditures from 2011 onwards. From 2011 onwards, every year we have done it, we have to cut in public expenditure. That is showing up as a lower deficit, and that is also showing up as lower growth rates. So it's not, and on the banking side, what is actually catching up over a period of time is actually all the bad debts that you accumulated during the period of your boom. It turns out that the boom period was actually very powerfully debt financed. And, and, the, and the negative impacts of that debt-led uh, growth pattern is actually chickens are coming home to roost. As of now, you can look at the uh, look and look at Vijay Malia, you can look at uh, NPS and so on. How uh, that uh, uh, pile up of debt is coming back to haunt us now. So decoupling, I don't believe we were ever decoupled. Uh, for for a while, we escaped uh, the proximate impacts of the crisis, but I don't think we ever were uh, decoupled. Uh, the last point, the data accuracy and all. Yeah, but there are different ways of tallying it, and so we have, we have there are different ways of cross checking it. We have to, uh, I don't believe many, many of the secondary data sources, I don't believe. Some I believe. So sometimes I believe, sometimes I don't believe. Right? So there's a, there's a constant element of cross checking that you need to carry out with primary data, cross checking primary and secondary data, uh, looking at secondary data, how consistent they are over a period of time, given other trends that you have. You have to have, you have, to have uh, reliability checks in, in secondary data sources that uh, those are available which needs to be done. Uh, where Occupy movement fools, uh, well, it's not true. They were not true. They were, they, were, they were reacting to an immediate crisis in their livelihoods. I am part of the Occupy London movement. I participated in uh, it. I know, uh, I've spoken to people, I, I know what, uh, th there were people who uh, were paying triple the amount that they used to pay before the NHS crisis had set into London. And there were people who had lost employment, and the two, three members had lost employment in their family, and they were just going around without any social support. Oh, that's, that's the kind of people who, they were rich people, who richer in the sense of the upper uh, strata of the, of the society, who lost jobs, un unfortunately, and then caught into all kinds of troubles, and they were also part of the movement. All kinds of people were there. So, and, and they said, the most important slogan there was, capitalism is the crisis. Capitalism is the crisis. The crisis is capitalism. So it is from there. So they also look for an alternative from there, but they also don't know what kind of alternative it is. So if you believe that Occupy participants in the Occupy movement knew of an alternative, I think you're wrong. I don't think they also knew what an alternative could be. They also had some idea of what the future should look like. That's all. Let me introduce the one thing which I certainly think is not intentional was to come here written as an apologist of the capitalist system. Please, let me make it clear. Capitalism does delivers only when it is set under regulatory institutions. There is no capitalism that delivers the goods without regulatory supervision. And what I was talking about was bring in regulatory safeguards that would ensure secure living for all. That requires eternal vigilance by people under the democratic dispensation.
that democratic dispensation is something which came through the economic space maturing into a political space. Make no mistake about it. It came in the wake of prosperity, again, which was vastly iniquitous to begin with, but that prosperity led to workers in the West acquiring the political space to demand democratic institutions. And I think it's an important lesson from history that political space has got to be nurtured and we have got to make sure that they continue to survey, I mean, you know, continue to be nurtured in the Indian context. One minor point about the, the, the different context in which Western capitalism thrived. But then let me make it very clear. I mean, it's true that they migrated to all those less populated countries, but that did not deteriorate. Uh, decline the unemployment rate in those countries anywhere. But then the point remains, in the latter day, we are also migrating, not as colonizers, but as migrant workers all over the world. And that's making a major difference to the economy of Kerala and also to the economies of the places where they are going. They're going in, they're not going as welfare scroungers. They're going as contributors to the production of income and wealth in those countries. And the remittances they, they send back, by the way, in the context of a state like Kerala, it comes to a trillion rupees. And don't underestimate its importance. So the global economy certainly confers benefits to all those who are taking part in it with a responsibility and respect for the other person. And there are important lessons to be learned out of it. Thank you very much. The rubber question. No, rubber situation is created by a kind of overproduction which can be seen in many sectors because of the global uh, crisis. The demand is not growing as uh, many people were expecting. Uh, but in the rubber case, there was a planned effort to increase the supply also. In India, in most of the natural rubber producing countries, World Bank uh, uh, assistance or where World Bank induced expansion programs were undertaken simultaneously. So overproduction in the rubber sector is not market driven alone. It's also driven by international institutions who were caring for the bias of natural rubber, that is the tire manufacturers. Now that overproduction is creating uh, uh, lower prices in the in the global market. Our problem is that no, we don't have any any border restrictions now. Our economy is open. So all this excess rubber, low price rubber, it's coming to Indian market. Our imports are going up. So India alone, unless we plug the borders, India alone cannot or Kerala alone cannot have a procurement policy. Uh, in fact, I told uh, Mr. Mani when he announced the first procurement program that even if you spend the entire Kerala budget for procuring rubber, you are not going to ensure fair prices for rubber growers in, in Kerala because rubber from other countries are going to come, which is coming in a big way. Now, I'm sorry, I disagree, but No, I have two, three purpose. <laughs> I, can, I can give you and then we will continue this discussion. Uh, because you know, on rubber or anything, there are many views. And uh, no, the <laughs> so we'll, we'll conclude this uh, session because it's high time to start the uh, final function. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Ram Kumar and Dr. Dose for presentation. Thank you, Professor K. N. Harlal, for effectively chairing this session. And uh, thank you, Professor A.V. Jones and Professor Ram Kumar for such a wonderful presentations. And thank you, audience. We'll have a quick tea break of five minutes and we'll be back for our validatory session. We look forward to your active participation in that too. Thank you. May I request uh, Dr. N. Veeramankandam, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Kerala. Our uh, valedictorian of the function, Chief Guest Professor K.P. Kannan, Chairman Laurie Baker Center for Habitat Studies, Trivandrum, and uh, Honorary Director of IUCAE, Professor A. Abdul Saleem, to kindly come over to the dais and have a seat. It is my pleasure to invite one and uh, one all all of you to the valedictory session of the three-day international conference.
organized by the Inter University Center for Alternative Economics, Department of Economics, University of Kerala. After three days of rigorous intellectual exercise of addressing the development questions of past and present, we hope that this whole exercise will be fruitful in setting a different pathway to development in the coming times. Let us start the function. For the welcome address, may I invite our guiding spirit and most respected head of the department, Dr. Manju S. Nair, to the days. Chairperson's address. The Chief Guest of this Gallery, Professor Professor Kirtikaya, the Chairman of the Center for 
conducted studies. Government Jewish Life at the Department of Economics. Also, we sent her to study all the direct payments in the The city commanded the public to work the conference under their dignities of the dais, delegates, faculty members, and my students and friends. So now it is the back end of this three day international conference. And Dr. Manjula has already pointed out the words for people discussions for the last hours so regarding this automatic thinking that itself shows that this seminar is a success. That means it has produced some spark on individual to think uh, whether an uh, alternative mode of economics, whether it is essential or not. So in that way, I think that this seminar is success. And I hope that these uh, six, uh, six sessions were there in these release programs and these six, six sessions were all uh, with evident process we have, we have had. And definitely, I hope that this uh, release program has produces some spark on it and think in a different way. So rather than thinking in a more data dimension way. So in this uh, context I feel definitely I feel that and I, and I congratulate the organizers, Dr. Professor Sali and Dr. Siddiq Rabiat and his faculty members who are the organizers of this uh, seminar. And I do wish uh, the, some beautiful thinking or uh, alternative thinking that may arise from the, 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 the researchers and the, the others who are in the field of economics. Uh, time wish all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Siddiq Rabir, the conference coordinator and faculty of the Department of Economics, has been the dynamic person behind its organization alongside Dr. Salim to present the reporter's report and also to present the message of Professor Samir Amin. May I invite you, sir, to the base? Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, respected Chair, Dr. Uh, and uh, uh, Benedictive Speaker, uh, Professor Khan, and uh, uh, other uh, uh, dignitaries on and off the guys. Actually, we had, uh, we, we already uh, came to the fact end of the program. Uh, so my my task is to basically reflect on what is actually we have we had uh, in the course of uh, the last three days, and uh, we, of course, uh, without any doubt, we have actually um, uh, had some sort of uh, illuminating ideas and uh, disagreements and agreements on different directions. And in that context, it is actually uh, while we were actually. Um, uh, formulating the very uh, title itself, that is the development question in a developing economy, uh, is in fact actually, uh, in my mind, is actually served its spirit because it it is basically you know emanated a certain uh, uh, sort of questions and which is actually moves out to the very single fit uh, development or whatever sort of neoclassical understanding or <coughs> mainstream understanding. So in that sense, at least we are now recognized that there is actually uh, the empirics or the reality is actually not fit in the, the, the theoretical understanding which we have or we are actually employed to basically reflect on different issues in the society. So in that sense, we feel that this uh, entire program or in the entire uh, the uh, the entire program which we uh, conducted is actually uh, uh, say something something which is very very really relevant. So I now come to my uh, task that is uh, to report about the program and uh, we had actually an excellent speech uh, two excellent speech in the inauguration and that is actually uh, first one is delivered by uh, Professor Rani Roman on the discipline of economics and the quest for alternatives and the second uh, uh, a speech was by Professor Patnaik on the globalization and development democracy. Uh, this two lecture is exemplary and it is actually uh, 
basically question the conventional understanding of uh, or the conventional way of putting up uh, to, uh, to see the economics and the issues which we are actually uh, facing and it is criticizing even uh, start from the curriculum to the approach which we adopt. Uh, then uh, Professor Patnaik, uh, I'm actually, because of the uh, time limit, I'm actually not going to the details of the presentation, which will be anyway uh, printing and uh, we uh, circulate all the uh, participants. In the second uh, day, that is started with a technical session, uh, which was um, chaired by um, Professor uh, uh, Prabhat Bhatnaik again, and uh, 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 Professor Joss was given an excellent uh, speech on developing the experience of Kerala. Uh, some strategic choice for the future, and he was actually uh, talked about the historical evolution of the very idea of Kerala strategy or whatever, uh, whatever which we discussed um, uh, since 1966, uh, sorry, 76 onwards. So, uh, in that context, it was actually a little illuminating uh, uh, regarding different aspects and dynamics of the society, which we are actually. And then uh, Professor uh, Dr. A. P. Srigaj and Subin Dennis also reflected the new changes um, uh, in uh, in different contexts. Uh, Srigaj had actually pointed that there is a radical departure from uh, uh, the, the group experience of Kerala because of uh, moving from mass-based consumption to the elite-based consumption. So with that itself, and uh, the growth was actually derived because of that. So which is actually a very, very, very interesting uh, result from the NSSO survey. And uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Subin also had uh, his own version of the uh, development experience, which is actually people centric on that than the, the uh, other sort of uh, understanding. Then in the th uh, second technical session, we had a discussion, I mean, a excellent uh, discussion by Professor Padmini, and she was, uh, you know, she referred to the case that actually the, the, the larger section of the society was missed out from the very idea of the development and the very the integral of development, which is women. And uh, many, uh, her, she was pointing two cases, one is ASHA workers and then uh, the other uh, Anganwadi plus the para-teachers cases. And which has in fact eliminated a lot of uh, different perception on how the, uh, the, the marginalizations are actually missed out from the mainstream and mainstream understanding and development. Then uh, we had uh, three presentations in that session. Uh, Dr. Anandar had spoke about the reservation, community reservation in MSG, and where she was actually, she had uh, done an excellent uh, field work, and which is, of course, somebody has to actually look into and, uh, that uh, field work is, and uh, she had a sample of uh, something around 160, uh, you know, village, uh, which is, I think almost 20 percent of the total. So, in that sort of a big sample, which in fact had a, a relatively very very uh, telling results about that uh, sort of understanding, especially the community reservation and whatever her conclusions are all actually some sort of uh, idea which we have to actually carry forward on when, when you talk about the LSD and the other things. Then uh, Dr. Christopher also had a, a presentation on the uh, co common common food resources in uh, context, and it is also very illuminating. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have that uh, third presentation uh, uh, because of some other reasons of the center. But then we started the third uh, technical session, which was on development yeah. development in the sector of concern, where uh, uh, unfortunately we didn't have. Uh, uh, Om Karma because he had uh, some health, severe health problem and uh, he's in fact under uh, uh, some uh, treat medication and also uh, therefore we missed him but uh, 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 Dr. Kabir had actually a wonderful presentation again uh, based on uh, the NSSO 70th round and uh, 70th round which is basically uh, a point that there is uh, the, the, especially the community, intra and inter community uh, disparity uh, vis a vis the inequality and the, the, the sort of reservation uh, sort of thing. So uh, that is, in fact, a very interesting paper. And uh, Dr. Shaijan also had a very different paper, which is talked about the service like growth strategy <coughs> and its limit. And uh, the fourth session was, in fact, I would say, uh, very, very uh, vibrant because we had eight papers which uh, discussed about eight different angles of 
uh, eight different issues. Uh, however, I won't say that actually it's all uh, particularly on alternatives, but uh, it is basically reflected on different angles. And so we had actually uh, be able to basically manage eight uh, researchers into the session. And um, sorry that actually we couldn't give much time for them, although we wished, but uh, because of the time constraint and all, maybe we had some sort of uh, uh, uncomfortability. But coming to today's session, of course, uh, no doubt that all of you were present and uh, the political economy was, we had obviously very interesting uh, papers, of, uh, especially Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Selim had uh, given a very, uh, very interesting picture about the uh, higher education. And then the newspaper is very good. And uh, it, is, uh, it is basically telling you where is actually the repression and where is actually uh, the increasing profit which is ha actually happening. And uh, then uh, Samantosh is also talking about, as I talked about, the, uh, the uh, different uh, uh, land holding patterns and where have to actually be to take a affirmative policy. And uh, find, uh, my user also had a very interesting uh, view on the debt, uh, debt uh, political economy question of uh, how to get and then the fourth, uh, sorry, in the sixth session, we didn't actually have our professor there. Yeah, in the fourth session also. Again, uh, because of some health reason, Professor Atre was unable to basically attend this function. However, we managed with uh, uh, Professor Gulbul, and she had uh, done a wonderful chairing session. And uh, there, we, we had actually two presentations from uh, Dr. Nandres Nair and the other from Hysin, which is. Uh, 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 which is also, I feel, uh, conveyed something. But <laughs> so I, I wouldn't say about my second fact. Anyway, but uh, the, the uh, most uh, fruitful uh, uh, session was actually in the afternoon, which has had a very interesting panel discussion and uh, into discussions where basically uh, post on the alternatives, which is what precisely we were expecting. Because you cannot, as uh, Ram Kumar rightly pointed out, uh, you cannot actually say that X policy is going to give you Y result, especially in a complex, uh, you know, canvas of the world, real world. So in that context, you know, you have to basically uh, experiment, and uh, of course, in that sense, uh, uh, with, uh, all the discussions had uh, its own effect on uh, the understanding of alternative. Now we uh, realize, in the, at the end, I would like to say that now we at least realize that you know uh, uh, there are different uh, versions of the reality. And you should actually look the reality in a different perspective, not into a single uh, sort of or uh, one lens to understand the entire uh, segment of society and its uh, reality. So now, uh, I, I, after that, so this is actually about the uh, uh, the report. And uh, unfortunately, Professor uh, Amir couldn't come to the about 85. So uh, he sent us uh, 84 that uh, he's able to make the trip. So he sent us the, uh, the, the paper. It is titled The Historical Capitalism, Accumulation by Disposition. I would read the introduction alone. There are two, three there, paragraphs. So uh, otherwise, I am not actually doing justice towards what we expected. So dominant bourgeois thoughts has replaced the historical reality of capitalism by an imaginary construction based on the principle claimed the eternal of the rational and egoistic behavior of the individual. A rational society produced by the competition required by the principle is thus seen as having arrived at the end of history. Conventional economics, which is fundamental base of this thinking, therefore substitute the generalized market for uh, reality of capitalism and uh, each of the capitalist market. So Marxist thought has been built upon up based on quite another vision, that of the permanent transformation of the fundamental structure of society, which is always historical. In this framework, that of historical materialism, capitalism is historical, had had a beginning and will have an end. Accepting this principle, the nature of this historical capitalism should be the, uh, the object of continual uh, reflection, which is not always the case in the ranks of the historical Marxism. That is Marxism as interpreted by those who claim it. 
Certainly, one can accept the very uh, general idea that capitalism constitutes a necessary stage preparing conditions for socialism, a more advanced stage of human civilization. But this idea is too general and insufficient, precisely because it reduces capitalism necessary stage to, to really existing historical capitalism. No, there in this paper, he is arguing uh, five people, four important points. Yeah, five important points, so I will out that five important points. The first one is accumulation to disposition is a permanent feature in the historical history of capitalism. A history of historical capitalism is therefore imperialist by nature at all stages at all stages of development in the sense that it polarizes uh, by the inherent effect of the laws that governs it and, uh, from this it follows that this capitalism cannot become the unavoidable stage of the peoples of the peripheries of the historical capitalist capitalism system that is uh, necessary to create here as elsewhere in the center of the system the condition for overtaking by it by uh, socialism the development and underdevelopment are the two inseparable sides of the historical capitalism point. So this historical capitalism is itself inseparable from the conquest of the world by the Europeans. It is inseparable from Eurocentric ideology, which is by definition a non-universal form of civilization. The other forms of the response uh, to the need for accelerating accumulation compared with the rhythm of the accumulation of ancient epoch of civilization a necessary premise for the socialism of the future would have been possible. This can be discussed, but uh, these forms perhaps visible in an embryonic way elsewhere that uh, in Europe of the transition to capitalism, especially example in China and others, have not been implemented as they have been crushed by the European context. Thus, there is no alternative for human civilization other than to engage in a construction of socialism. This is in turn being based on the strategic concepts that must command uh, the objective result produced by the globalized and polarizing expansion of Western capitalism or imperialism. So with this, I conclude uh, this, this uh, thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have none other than the former director and honorary fellow of Center Development Studies, Center for Development Studies, and presently the chairman of Laurie Baker Center for Habitat Studies, Professor K.P. Kanan, as the chief guest of our valedictory session today. It is with great pleasure I invite you, sir, for the valedictory address. First of all, Chancellor of Kerala University, and the Department of Economic Dr. Mandura, uh, Salam, Asali, and all other uh, professional colleagues, students, and friends. Let me first of all thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to uh, meet you all, and we will go for a brief while listening to a very exciting session. Although we tend to focus a little too much on our own state, that's quite natural. Um, I will listen to the rapporteur's uh, uh, report and the number of speakers who have already spoken to you in fact, you. And I'm sure from the ideas have already been put on the table and discussed best and it's all happening in the context of a rather ambitious title at the Inter University Center for Alternatives in Economics. And therefore it's quite natural that you're all looking forward for some alternatives in economics. Why are we not talking about alternatives in sociology? Or alternatives in politics? I thought that's the most urgent alternative that we need, isn't it? But anyway, I think economics has been a very dynamic subject in social science, as you all know. And it has dragged itself into so many fields, including our bedrooms, Gary Becker, and other people, economics of marriage, economics of child bearing, economics of love. 
a whole range of things which you may not be aware of. So be with that. Uh, that kind of alternative is also. Um, but I think there's a valid question to ask that the mainstream economics, and uh, by mainstream we all mean neoclassical economics, although it's quite recent, it was in the 1870s, Robert Mar Alfred Marshall Longers. Till then it was the uh, classical political economy that prevailed. And I'm one of those students who were brought up in the classical political economy, happened to be a student of Bombay University, and all of our teachers, Professor Damanan, Professor Kya, Professor Lakhavala, a whole range of people who were pers persuaded by classical economics. And one of our the best uh, products of our department, who later on became JNU fame, Professor Krishna Bharadwaj. He's an outstanding uh, classical uh, economy person. And I think it's still relevant to our question of not just creating wealth, but it's that's central to the classical political economy. And they also dealt with large aggregates. Basically, what we now call macroeconomics. They were not bothered about by your marginal changes and your marginal productivity gains and uh, you know efficiency gains from one factor or the other factor. Much more than that, questions of uh, distribution across classes in society. I think that's still quite relevant, and we know that. So in that sense, some of the alternatives will have to come from the old, reclaiming the past. Not, in a, not exactly in its own you know, historical context, but I'm sure in its theoretical essence and concerns for understanding change in society. But the advent of neoclassical economics, actually, in my opinion, I think, or whatever limited reading I have done, is that it's also historically conditioned. Because by that time, Western economies, most of them were already uh, reasonably on their path of capitalist development. They were about to get out of the uh, feudal court. And by 1900, most of European societies have turned around the corner and, uh, corner and on to a part of Therefore, the question of allocation of resources became the dominant question for now. And I think it's quite you know, understandable uh, thinker and uh, scholar like Alfred Marshall picked up on that question of allocation from distribution to allocation. <coughs> and that became efficiency, that became the central point of mainstream economics, which continues to dominate academic teaching. I don't think in practical policy terms that is being followed in total. It is being branded about as because it has got ideological functions. And therefore they all claim, I am out and World Bank, they claim they are on the uh, you know conservative mainstream now classical economics. Efficiency is all about growth. Efficiency leading to growth. And then we can take out the other things later or in some other way. But I don't think there are many countries in the world in economic history where they have really followed neoliberal economic policies uh, to the full. Although the classical case of Britain is often uh, in court, the British experience has always been an exceptional experience. You take the continental Europe, it's quite different. They all had the project of modernization. And state became very an active agent in transforming the economy. Whether you talk about uh, Germany or, or France or any, other, or any other. So in that sense, I think we are being, third world, the developing countries are being told about the virtues of your classical economics by people who really don't believe in that virtuefully, even now. If you look at their public expenditure, the ratio of public expenditure to GDP is the highest in Europe. Many countries, what is the government doing now? They are not talking about minimizing government. They are maximizing government. As much as 40, 40 to 42 percent is candidate in countries, OECD average is about 26, 28 percent of the GDP is spent by the government. 
and we are much below, much below that ratio, most below countries. So that is it. So there is an ideological function, but unfortunately, our in the, in this country, and I have always felt that we have, academically speaking, the profession of economics has not been able to overcome this dominance of mainstream economics, basically of an American mind. The Europeans are a little more thought based. I don't know what is the reason for that. I'm not thought through that. But in all universities, in all colleges, all institutions, this mainstream economic teaching prevails. And then you add on to it a little bit of Keynesian economics. Call it yourself the best microeconomics. Basically, Keynesian economics was a subversion of the university. After the depression. We didn't worry about microeconomic problems. Ask questions of great relevance of unemployment, uh, lack of capacity utilization, and the need to you know, come find the economy and bring the active role of the state as an agent to pop up and enhance the economy and restart the engine again and then reduce unemployment. That was a subversion of the class, you know, although it was far from the Marxian. Uh, challenge to neoclassical so that that so that was an alternative and I think because of that we are now in a position to talk about a tradition of heterodox economics the, the mainstream economics has been dominated ideologically but in practice I think it is heterodox economics because that for me heterodox economics is basically plural that you don't rely on single set of well-defined tier because that would be very difficult in actual in the, in the real world. So there is the influence of those three issues. So there is the influence of historical school institutionalists. Now you have also environmental economics. And some of it can be you know linked up with the uh, other heterodox schools of thought gender issue, gender economics, sometimes refer to feminist economics. So there's a, quite a lot of schools of thought under the heterodox economics, from which you can derive inspiration and you are also you can derive analytical tools uh, to understand your society and to see what is much more important. And for me, the, the basic difference between the mainstream economics and the heterodox economics is mainstream economics takes such a position that for it, for that rationality is central. So we are all supposed to be very rational so long as your rationality is in terms of maximizing your utility or your profits, your capital. And you have, you also have there is no reference to history or historical time. There is only logical time in your present economics. There is no historical time. When you, when you learn about price and quantity adjustment, there is no history. But you say there is an adjustment. And you don't say, what is that time lag in this adjustment process? It's a logical exercise. So that's the, uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, mainstream economics that we have been talking about. But in heterodox tradition, we are in a position, and I find myself more comfortable because I am born and brought up in a country where history matters for everything, even what we are eating, isn't it? We have to be very careful what you are eating. Otherwise, some historical forces will come and tell you you are not supposed to eat this. Institutions matter. Now, you think of your marriage and your choice, and you will look at your parents, isn't it? The institutions dominate also our lives. Institutions matter, history matter. And we are also living in a society that has got its own very strong social structure. You may not like it, but that's what you have inherited. So you have to reckon with it. You can't ignore it. 
I think so from that social science perspective, it gives me much more flexibility when I am studying an economic problem to draw from the tradition of heterodox economics that I can either consciously or even without being very conscious of it, draw on historical dimension, on the institutional dimension, and the exact context, the social structure in which change or lack of change takes place. So that's the, uh, that's the way I would put our search for alternatives in economics. So from that point of view, for me, I think, if you confine yourself to mainstream economics by choice, now you have the choice, you have such growth of new branches that you don't even have to bother about your society at all. You have all kinds of neuroeconomics, you have got uh, power economics that is not related to social power but energy. Experimental economics, as if you can experiment with people. Of course, they have their own ways of doing experiments. We do experiments in the broad sense of the term when we do surveys. Experimental economics. But on the other side, if we are, under, if, if we are interested in understanding the broad contours of change, the pace of change, the dynamics of change, and what happens to different sections of the people, then we have much more stronger tradition. And I would say we also have then, following from our understanding of heterodox economics, heterodox tradition, then we will be much more friendly to other social sciences and respect them and listen to them. If I want to understand inequality in this country, in my society, I must also talk to sociologists. What do they see in our society? What kind of social structure, what kind of social hierarchy exists and how does that you know, carry such an enormous influence in the outcomes. We would also, because most policies are in a democratic uh, electoral politics, most decisions are made by political executives. And that, theoretically, they are also our representatives because we elect them. So in a way, there is an organic connection with their decisions and our desire, although it is not very instantaneous and everyday. Once in five years or so, you select them, give them your trust and faith so that they will carry out policies which you approve. If you don't approve, next time you don't give them. So politics is in command, whether you like it or not. Politics in command. That's also a political slogan. Politics in countries. So we will be much more compelled to listen to political science people. What, what do they say about the state? About its functioning, the governance system. How do policies get translated into programs? How effective? What is the kind of representativeness of our political system? So to that extent, I think if we are really interested in alternatives in economics, we have to look at so both within economics but also outside. Although our universities are structured along disciplinary boundaries, if I have an MA in sociology and I want to do a PhD in economics, no, 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 you can't do it. You are from sociology. Please go to the other department. That's quite sad. Because I, I studied sociology, because now I, I want to study economics because I want to apply this knowledge also to economic issues. And I must have the opportunity to take courses and credits and then do my thesis in economics. I don't know what prevents a sociology student in doing a thesis in economics if it is related to certain social issues. So in a way we are also uh, you know, compartmentalized ourselves. We even say we don't make our decisions. Whoever have made decisions on our behalf, the wise heads made it in such a way. And that's not the case in many but we often criticize advanced countries. You can pick and choose your courses. You can take a course with a few credits in music and then another few credits in economics and something else in chemistry. And you combine yourself, you accumulate credits. And then go later on, say, no, I have done all these three, but I want to do 
particular specialization in the next stage. So that kind of, I think, give and take academic exchange, internalizing the knowledge from different disciplines, that opportunity we are often denied. So if you want to do it, you have to do it by yourself. Of course you can do it. You can read it, you can read by yourself, which is much more uh, challenging than when you are being tutored in a, in, a, in a class. So that is the, that is the second thing that, that I would say. I would also say, contrary to some of the, uh, my friends and colleagues' opinion here, there have always been alternatives. Some alternatives were uh, adjustments of a sort, some certain changes. Some alternatives were very radical. Some sustained, some did not sustain itself. Socialism, the way it was practiced, completely collapsed, imploded in the Soviet Union, and it is gradually disappearing. Slowly, but very steadily disappearing in China. So that alternative did not stand itself to scrutiny of of historical time. You can, you can evaluate in whatever way that you, you say for the reason, whatever the good reasons or wrong reasons, that I don't know. But some of the reasons that I think is associated with lack of freedom to think differently. Isn't it? I may not agree with you, but you should have the freedom to say what you think Right. I may not agree. That does, that's a different thing. And that is democratic. So I think in a modern society, when we have already come out of the feudal bondage, the feudal regime, democracy is an integral part of a modern society. Because everybody should have a voice. And if that voice is foreclosed, and think that I can think of a set of people, a party can think on behalf of all the people, then you cannot sustain for long. But the principles don't die. The principle is rooted in equality, in emancipatory equality, not just mechanical equality. That means you must have the opportunities for creative, uh, using your creative potential from a lower level of human existence to a higher level of human existence, that is socialism. There should not be too much um, exploitation. So those principles, is, and it will continue to be so, and that's why we still find that there are movements which now use the word socialism, but without saying so in a completely different way. I think Europe again provides an example, because I think whatever you can criticize Europe for all its historical deeds, and I will be with you, but we should also see the kind of intellectual changes that are taking. We have not been able to mainstream the challenge of environmental destruction in our politics, but they have to a great extent. They are given a respectable space for this challenge of environment that has now become an integral part of economic development. Without referring to that, you cannot now define the meaning of it. And if it, has, if it gives rise to a person like Jeremy Corbyn, it's the manifestation of that thinking. He's a socialist, but he's also a green. He's also a feminist. He's also anti nuclear Just imagine. This is the new left. So at the intellectual level, what the traditional so-called socialists did not really care for, he has created or a time has come where new thinking has created space to factor these emerging concerns and issues. <coughs> and that's our failure. We don't have that kind of dynamic political space alternative where genuinely you can uh, debate, discuss and see that these factors are integrated into the new definition of socialism, not just democracy in the procedural sense of the term, but much more than that. Because the outcome of all these things will determine what kind of economic development that you are going to have. And therefore, there are alternatives. 
and therefore I think there is also space, but uh, Allah is not here. When he referred to whether at the regional, at the local level, do we have the autonomy, do we have the space to create arguments? Of course we have. That doesn't in any way diminish the importance of countering the larger forces, not at all, at the national and international level. And yet you can have your limited autonomy to create alternatives. If the Kudumbashri movement in Kerala, if they can champion organic agriculture as they do, or at least make a beginning, or at least talk about it, be conscious of it, they are creating an alternative in a space where they make a difference. It may not you know, amount to much, but it can be a pointer to the future. So it gives you a local space to translate your larger global ideas. So you cannot sit back and say change will come, and when the change will come, I'll start that. By the time you do it, you manage if, if that is the time frame. Sometimes you will not be there at all. So I think there is this notion of autonomy. And that autonomy is partly dependent on how much space we create with all the constraints. It's like constraint maximization no? or optimization exercises using a mainstream <laughs> vocabulary here. So I think that we need to we need to use that. Sometimes countries will open implicitly, but not say so, subvert the mainstream economics and proceed ahead. And that's what the East Asian development is about. Japan never said that we are going to challenge the Western classical theory. But they undermined it in their own way, remaining capitalist, of course, in their own way, and promoted industrialization as a project, as a national project, modernization as a national project. And in 1868, some of you care to read economic history, it's a very exciting subject. That's the turning point when there was an internal pressure and revolt to remove the feudal ruling class, the samurais, and bring back the monarchy, monarchy. And that's called the Meiji Restoration. And one of the first acts of the Meiji Restoration is to see that increased access to public education is given to all children. Japan was, Japan had a literacy rate higher than that of the United States in 1870. So you can imagine the importance that they gave to as a state agenda to education, something which we unconsciously practiced here much later. They promoted industry by the government made it successful ventures, and then handed over to private capital. That's their, that's their model. They had what you call in the literature, if some of you I'm sure you are aware of it, when you talk about industrialization, strategies for industrialization, industrial policy. Industrial policy is you pick and choose. The state decides what to develop. We had an industrial policy during the Nehruvian period, or till the late 80s. We wanted to develop the basic capital goods sector, certain kinds of industries. If our pharmaceutical industry is one of the most competitive in the world today, I would say it is due to policy. Policies on patenting, policies on encouraging smaller units, copying. Of course, copying has been a universal act. Although now much we talk about the value of protecting intellectual property and all kinds of things. The Americans copied from the British, the Germans copied, copied from the British, Every, everybody copied everybody else. And Japan was a case of continuous copying. But in that continuous copying, they also uh, applied what Schumpeter or Schumpeter would have called a certain kind of innovation. They miniaturized many things which were, you know, unthinkable of miniaturization. So their creative part came there. So you are not just photocopying. You are copying with your own brain into it. And that Japanese model appealed to many of the other East Asian countries.
countries, including their own ones, calling Korea. And Korea is much more. You know, uh, this famous book on Korea is that the rising child of something like that. And Korea is also a case, as in Japan, where in the process of economic development, foreign investment played a very minimal role. Now we are opening up everything to foreign investment, insurance, defense, banking, media, I don't know what not, e-commerce. Of course, foreign investments are not coming, that's another example. Korea is an example of maximizing the national savings investment, but in importing technology. Their only mission, or well, the national mission was, they should overtake Japan. That's because they had colonized them, that means they have colonized them. So that's another aspect of this. So when the East Asian success came, the World Bank just couldn't explain it in terms of conventional economics. I'm sure some of your teachers might have told you that. The miracle growth, they brought out a volume called the miracle growth. That means if they do, if Europeans do, it is normal. If Asians do make a success, it's something of a miracle. Not because of their inherent strength and consciousness and planning. The Japanese quietly funded another uh, project in Antal and brought out a series of studies which brought out the East Asian experience in much more detail and confronting this whole thesis of miracle project. Nothing to do with miracle, it's all our perspiration and our inspiration. So that's the Chinese was another alternative. The Chinese economic development is another alternative. Then, first 30 years, of course, yes. Although Mao also deviated from the Soviet model of uh, socialism. He had no collectivization of the kind that Soviet agriculture went to. So, peasants communists, in a way. Of course, they had their own problems famine and various other mistakes like any other country, they also make big mistakes. But they had what I would call leveling up and leveling down. People who did not have land, because they abolished property, private property in land, became just flat. Then really smooth and then according to if you are willing to be a farm, farm for good. Access to schooling for all, because all the Earlier feudal landlords were expropriated. Access to nutrition and health, employment, full employment. Although the remunerations were very modest and the inequality was very less. But that, I think, stood them in, 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 in a very good ground by the time they took a turn around, 30 years later, in 78, 79, when they decided for reasons of, I'm sure, maybe they wanted to compete with the world powers and China has always been considered by themselves that they are in the center of the world. The Middle Kingdom, all the others are bad That's the historical uh, projection of China. And they lost it and they must regain it. So if it is capitalism, so be it. But on their own terms. So these are all, you may not like the alternative, that's a different thing. It doesn't mean it doesn't, it's not an alternative. But if you have to have an alternative, then you must define what kind of alternative you want. Do you want to accept democracy as a basic principle, basic parameter? Then your alternative will be conditioned by your acceptance of democracy. If you think I don't care, people think not individual choice. So I should not talk in, uh, in singular, first person singular. It's all collective. If the, if the society thinks that democracy is important, and I think the Indian people decided it is important in 1977, when they threw out Mrs. Gandhi when she declared emergency. So unequivocally they made a political statement that we need we need freedom of voting, we need freedom of expression, we need a democratic framework. In that sense, I think 
the, the freedom fighters Nehru and Gandhi, they and Ambedkar, their mission was exactly in tune with the people's mission because many people criticize the uh, criticize them because in a country with 80 percent illiterate, how are you going to have universal adult franchise and elected democracy, electoral democracy? I think they were pro right in the game. If that is that, then the Indian situation is such that the question of distribution will be made because this is an unequal society for a very long period of time. And even with uh, independence and our desire for modernity, this inequality persists. At the, at the sharp edges, we have done some small bending, some small compromises, abolition of the there in more public schools, little more access to health care. There, there, there is you know, what I would call a snail's space of progress. So it's not that we don't have progress in that kind, but they're highly negative. And therefore, if because asset distribution is highly unequal, employment opportunities are highly unequal and also inefficient, and third indicators for a whole section of people are very poor, even with such high growth for the last 10 years. So you can ask the question that growth is not going to solve the problem of economy. So if you want to deflect that situation to inequality, and I think inequality has now become the central issue in almost all countries, whether rich or poor, whether it be one person versus 99 percent, the Occupy movement, which has, you know, which got the imagination of the youngsters and prospective labor force entrants in all of the uh, rich countries. Inequality is a subject which is bothering almost all countries. Take the Middle East, West Asian countries. The entire struggles for uh, getting the regimes, non-democratic regimes, out of power was arising from a sense of, you know, being not having enough access to opportunities. We have the formal democracy, but we don't have that space for the reason. Well, in fact, inequality has increased. So to say to a, you know, something which I myself have been trying last 10 years is that the book that I published, Interrogating Inclusive Poverty and Inequality in India, you will not find any inequality numbers there. But my purpose was to address inequality as a social issue. And I had come to the conclusion, of course sociologists would say, because for them, uh, but not in such a, uh, Macroeconomic terms. They say in the village uh, surveys would say there is a hierarchy, there are dominating caste, there are lower caste. But the caste also has a you know, very much associated with particularistic notions. No? So many. But we are not interested in that particularistic uh, way of thinking. That our discipline is not tuned to that. We are more interested in stylized statements because we deal with aggregates. So we need an idea of hierarchy. And the idea of hierarchy is that there are some social groups which are at the top. Wealth rights, income rights, quality of life, uh, education. There are some social groups who are at the bottom. So that is the value of this. There are intermediate groups, one or two. So I had taken four such large aggregate groups, SCST at the bottom. Muslims and OBCs in the intermediate and the rest of the population as others. It's not an arbitrary classification because that is based on the distribution of wealth. If you look at the NSS surveys on distribution of wealth and rank populations according to their social groups, you will find except Muslims, all other minority communities in India, on an average, six Christians, Parsis, Jains, and upper caste communities belong to a certain upper average. And the lowest is the SCST. The SC is the lowest. The ST is very poor because they still have traditional land, a little bit of land. And the, land, and the SCs are almost diverse. So it's not just arbitrary. It's, but these are broad aggregates of social groups based on economic rights. So it's, you can say it's a kind of marriage 
can we allow marriage between economics and sociology? So they together understand each other. Yes, there is a social identity too, but it meshes with your economic life. And that is the social inequality mapping that I have done for income, for education, for employment, quality of employment, proper employment, cash flow work, conditions of work, a whole range of things. And what I find is uh, not something the sociologists have reported, although observationally people might talk about it. What I find is this hierarchical inequality. It's not just the inequality of various consumption groups that we talk about. Then we're probably in this is based on the social grouping hierarchical. That means those who are at the top remain at the top. Those who are at the bottom remain at the top, even with change. So if I am at the bottom, it's a CST group, my average changes, let's say my income rises from 100 to 105, 5 percent change. If the top changes from 200 to 210, the ratio remains the same. Inequality remains the same. Also, the benefits are different. The benefit there it is 10 units, here it is 5. But what we find is their rate of change is 3%, the bottom change is 5%. So if you exclude the develop and only concentrate on the bottom, oh yes, they have made some progress in absolute terms. So there is a requirement of absolute decline doesn't necessarily mean a decline in any point. Which means you are running faster than me. You are able to run faster than me. I am also running. But you are running faster than me. So our gap is. So there is not only a inequality question to begin with, increasing inequality question, even on this short period of high growth. So the whole notion of trickle down helps it. If this is the way we because we have to look at economics as a social science and always whether what I, my welfare depends not just, I am not an isolated entity. My welfare depends on my neighbor's welfare. Because I compare with them. It's relational, isn't it? Whether we are all able to move together or some are moving faster, some are not. So you can have change with inequality or change with equality. So that both possibilities are there. And the social dynamics is such that it has strengthened to me. I would say that's another way of looking. That's an also an alternative. Because here we are trying to take the help of other social categories. Other than there are many other questions that are asked in this, but I just wanted to say the possibilities are not just pedagogic only only at the realm of teaching, you can also translate that. There are several examples of such cross-disciplinary work in India, many political economies. If you look at the work of Satish Deshpande, for example, if you look at the work of people who are now working on environmental issues, because mainstream economics cannot handle the question of external interests. At a micro level, well, they may handle it compensation. If you produce pollution, your factory, the only way is to I, uh, I put a fine on you or tax on you, the polluter pays. But if all of us creates that political effect. Mainstream economics cannot handle certain kinds of aggregate problems, not aggregate, macroeconomic, what they call global bad, public bad. Global bad and global good. Carbon emission is a global bad. Because you cannot handle it from a micro individualistic point of view. Only societies will have to come together, countries will have to come together and act together. Otherwise, you can defeat the purpose very fast. There are alternatives also coming from gender studies, a whole range of gender studies, and including in India. So you should look at it. In practical terms, when some of us, uh, as Tyler was mentioning, looked at the functioning of the panchayat, although it's a governance mechanism, it is making a change in terms of our economic development trajectory. 
the kind of issues they are handling and the kind of time lag that they can handle or they can reduce, for example, for local level decisions. Better schools, better primary health care centers, better roads, better social security pension distributions. It also makes a difference. That can also constitute an alternative or it, 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 uh, it need not be a textbookish developmental model. It could make a difference the way development and process is taking place. So we need to, I think, we need to be aware of that. And in the whole world, there is a search. In Latin America, there is a serious search. And they were hoping that if only, some would say it's social democratic. I think social democratic is a very good solution. It's not a question whether, whether you like capitalism or not. How do you confront it when it actually and social democracy had certain answers. It didn't go away the way uh, conventional socialism had been around. Scandinavian is another variety, their own way of working. They, 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 they had the social contract, although within a larger frame of capitalism, but mellowed in their own way through regulation, through taxation, through a whole range of public policies. The role of public policy, very important. So there are alternatives, and the world is not always, uh, you know, in a straightforward line. So I don't think there is any need for uh, throwing up your hands, uh, saying that there are no alternatives. You have to also be participating in, in one way or another. And I think as students of social science, we are all in a position to do so. I would also like you, for the first time in history, there are countries which have now emerged and challenging the power of the West economically. And they are all from different social structures, social backgrounds, and history. I don't know how many of you have seen this book called Catch Up. Okay, Deepak Maya. Story is Catch Up. Catching Up. Identifying countries in the developing countries who have made a difference for the first time in history in shifting global economic power. Now the share of the world output, which used to be almost 80%, with the OECD countries, which represents the advanced capitalist countries, Western, America, Europe, and Japan, is now 65, to 30, from 80%, so 35% on this side. That's a major shift. It's not a very major shift, it's a shift. And made possible by a few countries who had, in this way, one way or another, had their own way of adapting to the policies and challenges. And that includes Thailand and Vietnam and South Africa and India and China. Not all of them are in the same boat. But that's a big that's for that's a big statement in economic history of the tenth asset. So there are you also may have seen the writings of Kajun Chan. You know that? Korean author Ha Jun Chan. Doesn't make any familiar, doesn't strike you with any familiarity. You should. Kicking away the ladder is first book. That you should. Kicking away the ladder. And then the, there's a paperback on development architects. Set books. Where he gives out how, how he, from the Asian experience, he brings out how this counters the mainstream market. Of Anglo-Saxon argument that uh, you know, classical property to equilibrium, individualistic choice is the main economic theory and policy that ought to be worked. Is that everything is against that mainstream what the Asian countries are following, especially East Asia, including his own country, and that he demolishes many myths of because of their Confucian culture, because of their you know ability to work hard and all kinds of things. At one time, they were criticized for being lazy because they are all Confucians. So now they are being praised for being Confucians because you work more. So I think there are a lot of things to talk about. I happen to be a member of a panel called International Panel on Social Progress, a collective of scholars, 160 scholars in all over the world, led by Professor Amatasi. And our task is to produce a global report on social progress. If 
then social problems. So it's a request to the students. And it's very exciting. You know, like uh, that's the assassin. I don't know if you say can we assign to you, that's the assassin. Or uh, John Homer. John Homer said and came in our Istanbul meeting that our report should be an anti captain statement. And he was not just uh, giving a slow. John Roman is a very hardcore economic theoretician who works on the question of distribution, very serious, on alternatives. So there are, because it's not all that cynical and disappointing. A lot of people are thinking about it. It takes time. We must have the patience, but we must also have the willingness to be part of it. Thank you very much. And I think I've taken more time than uh, I should. But I should once again thank the audience for giving me this opportunity and I'm sure of this. Thank you, sir. Finally, we are really hopeful that uh, this whole seminar exercise ended on a positive note and at least 10 different alternatives across the world have been pointed out by Sir. I wish we had him in the panel discussion session where he could share more of his ideas and uh, you know, sell us more alternative ways that uh, we didn't discuss over these days. Next, may I invite Vijay Street to share her views on the seminar. Actually, I would like to represent the whole viewer community or the audience to on uh, for view the seminar for the three days. And uh, actually, I should say the seminar, the first international conference organized by the center, has in fact planted the seed to the whole the thought the thought process of alternative economics. As uh, Sir has said, uh, it is actually the pathway we are just moving on to. And, and this whole seminar was actually, when we go to a seminar as students, what we feel is, yeah, today we'll be getting or more exposure. But what I felt yeah, all these three days was that it was not an exposure, it was an explosion of ideas. We were getting, we were actually plunged into many ideas, many new concepts. Actually, uh, the whole things were new, novel concepts and they were, not even developed even in the global uh, outlook. So I would like to thank the whole organizers of this uh, event, uh, especially Salim sir, the honorary director of the center and department of economics, HOD, our beloved HOD, uh, Manjo ma'am, for setting a platform for us, uh, for having such a great exposure for us. Actually, as I mentioned, it's not an exposure, it's an actually explosion of ideas. Again, every day, four, five, six, the three days when we were coming, we were uh, we could meet so many distinguished personalities and uh, it was actually like having uh, so many diverse ideas on one platform. We could see heterogeneous ideas, we could view new new concepts and uh, it was actually an inductive process. On the first day we were accustomed to development trajectories of Kerala. Then slowly to this next session was about India then sectoral uh, diversities and today was uh, as in Malayalam we say Kalasha Kutta. We were having uh, you know like development problems, we were having uh, the scope uh, sir was saying about microfinance institutions. So it, it was actually a, um, it was it was like a storm of uh, ideas and new concepts and what I found uh, about regarding this whole conference was that this is the first international conference, but uh, surprisingly it does not seem to be because it was well organized. Plus, what, was, what stood out was actually that uh, it was not only really a platform for uh, professional economists or the teaching community, research community, so scholars and PG students like us were also well, well represented and our ideas also get got uh, involved. But, uh, and we were really fortunate to have uh, been a part of the seminar, I mean conference. Again, um, but actually uh, I should say alternative economics is a virgin concept and it is uh, far more to the, uh, it's just a long way to go. And we expect next conference also. And we expect, we have, uh, actually the conference has set the great hurdle, it has set the mark to be there. So we expect the next conference to be still better and um, with that note, I would like to say thank you. Thank you, Vijayasri.
May I invite the man whose brainchild is the whole center and uh, this international conference, Professor A. Abdul Salim, Assistant Professor, Department of Economics, whose untiring efforts can't be thanked in words. I invite you, sir, to propose the formal vote of thanks. Respected Professor Kamen, sir. Professor Ram Kumar. My dear friends, I have been testing your patience for the last three days and almost 5.15. So I don't want to uh, test your patience further. Uh, so I want to wind up within two or three minutes. Uh, we have uh, got very excellent sessions, very good discussions, more provoking presentations and above all a lot, a lot about the alternatives. We have to travel a lot. When, uh, when uh, I, with my friends, conceived this idea, I never thought of this task, the task ahead. Uh, now I am, I am afraid how to... Uh, uh, but the thing is that I am confident also because I am not alone. I have a... Uh, I have a uh, four professors along with me and large number of uh, highly intelligent, uh, marvelous students who can also be certain times creating spirits, I said. So, wonderful ideas we had from the students, very good questions from them. So, in fact, I really appreciate my, uh, the delegates. Participant, participants, etc., etc., for their uh, effective intervention. Uh, generally, the things are not being done this way. See, right from 9:30 to 5, all are here in the hall. All are here. No doubt or doubt about it. Even if somebody uh, is there outside, I used to call them inside. So, uh, <laughs> so, so. Uh, in fact. I bend my head before you for your effective participation. Okay, so uh, my dear friends, lots of research persons turned up, except two or three. But we have given, see, thinking of this eventuality, we have given uh, sufficient slots more for more research persons. So ultimately, uh, for every session, or every session is bundled with the resource persons. Uh, but the problem is positive one. Anyway, all the resource persons could articulate their points very well. That is what I have inferred from your participation and your active intervention in the discussion. So that's all. Now, see, well begun things always end well also. So we have started very well. And you see, uh, this is not going to end so fast, isn't it? We are going to have more and more programs. See, next October we are going to have an international conference on education in a developing economy. Okay, so problems, policies and pro perspectives. This is the title given to this. And uh, we want to have the, uh, the help from the resource persons like Kanan sir and uh, Ram, Kumar is also, Ram Kumar is also here. And uh, uh, now itself I invite you people to come <laughs> <laughs> for the event. So, so contribute uh, for the event. Now next January also we have already announced another program. Under the coordinatorship of Zidik we are going to have another international conference on law and economics. So these things were sorted out uh, uh, under the PVC's chairmanship. Okay. So I want your uh, assistance for all this. Uh, okay. Now Thanksgiving in a few words. Uh, Our Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. N. Veeramani Randan, sir. Professor M. A. Umman, Professor Prabhat Patnaik, Professor A. V. Jos, Professor Patmini Swaminathan, Professor M. Kabir. Professor Ramakumar, Dr. Ken Harilal, Professor K.P. Kannan, Professor Mridil Ipan. They were the main speakers in our event. Okay. Now, other paper presenters are there 
See, I'm not uh, spelling their uh, names uh, uh, for positive of time. All have done very well on behalf of the university, on behalf of the center, department, department of economics, on our personal behalf. From the uh, center, uh, center Sex Governing Council, I extend a hearty welcome to all of them. Uh, I extend a hearty thanks to all of them. Okay, then I also extend uh, my hearty thanks to all the uh, all the uh, persons who presented purpose. Uh, for in the case of the research, research colleagues from the different universities like University of Rajasthan, University of Central University of Gujarat from JNU, etc. We, uh, we could not give much, de much justice to them, uh, particularly uh, yesterday uh, my friend Subair was highly agitated and uh, apology for the same. Say, uh, we could not give much time to you. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, we will get more chances. Uh, thanks to all of you, the paper presenters. Now, finally, uh, professors from the other departments, uh, from other universities, other colleges, uh, and also departments of the same university. Uh, they all have participated in the event. Uh, in the event. I uh, extend hearty thanks to them. Okay. Then uh, my research colleagues, students, then MPhil students, technical staff, uh, staff from the Kerala University, uh, all, uh, their, uh, all have extended their timely help for the a successful completion of this event on behalf of the de uh, department and also on behalf of the sender and on my personal behalf. I extend 30 times to all of them. Uh, now, Anjata has given a wonderful duty of uh, uh, comparing all these things, anchoring all these things. Uh, in spite of uh, her uh, the other engagements, she came here and they spent all the three days for the event, helped us. Uh, I extend thanks to you. Then she has assigned some jobs to the to all the students. All proved their leadership, and we expect the same cooperation in future also. See, uh, unless you helped us, it would not have been possible. No doubt about it. We we, we stood together. All the teachers and students stood together. That that, that was why we could. Uh, the, we wind up the events like this. So thanks to all of you, and uh, press was there, and the other uh, the media, and also uh, the uh, the uh, Mo Catering Agency, and all the all the people are there. Then the electrician. Uh, I don't know uh, whether I have uh, forgotten some people. For all of them, I extend hearty thanks. Uh, uh, thanks to all once again. Now. Nothing more to say. Thank you.